Hello, my darlings. Mother Raven here with another tale to frighten and delight. This one is a no-sleep Lord Lackland. It's called The Monster Under My Bed Has Saved My Life Every Night For the Past Twenty Years. Until I was seventeen, a chance encounter with a dog could paralyze me in fear. Although it was one of those irrational phobias that harmed me more than kept me safe, it held a foundation in reason, or so I told myself. When I was about six, I was chased up a tree by an immense black wolf. It never bit or scratched me. But ever since, I've relived the event continuously. Every evening, when I close my eyes, I can see him. His red eyes, as my childlike imagination constructed, bored into my soul before I turn around and flee. As if these dreams and their, their coinciding insomnia weren't enough for young me, fate also decided to rent out the space below my bed to a monster, one that followed me from bed to bed for the past twenty years. It's not unusual for children to imagine monsters under their bed, Perhaps it's a way of rationalizing all the world's evils for which their minds are not yet equipped to understand. My monster just happens to be accompanied by an unmistakable scent of burning sulfur, but I never really thought that the scratching and odor under my bed were anything else other than the house settling. At least not until I received the first chink in my armor of logic and reason. One night, when I was 16, we had a break-in. And by we, I mean I, because both of my parents were on vacation and my sister had left to go get high with her boyfriend. I was pouring myself some melatonin from my bedside table when the burglar entered the house. I heard him, I first heard him rummaging around the living room. Then I made out desolate creaking of the stairs. When the man's shadow swept beneath my door, I scurried out of my covers and under my bed. That's when I saw the dog. About as immense as a calf, he lay facing me in a sphinx-like prone, his white fur immaculately clean despite the decades of dust and grime that had built up on my floor. Oddly, he had hooves and small horns like a goat, but there was no denying that he was a dog otherwise. What solidified my terror-induced freeze were his eyes, like the ones I'd seen in the woods. They were a lurid scarlet. But unlike that beast, these were not rage-filled eyes. They were wide, giving him an almost surprised expression. When the door opened, he snapped his head in its direction, and a large hoof slammed against my face in time to suppress a scream. That was when I fainted, though I am proud to have held out for thirty seconds or so. When I woke up, I was back in bed. The sheets tucked in sloppily around me. I slowly lowered my head past my bed frame, but there was nothing there. Not even the dust. The dust. My heart sank as I noticed the large disturbance in the usual grime, dotted with hoof prints that would have been left by a large hound. I think I fainted again because I woke up on the floor with a massive headache around 11 a.m. This time the dust had resurfaced. I inspected the house only to find that nothing had been stolen or misplaced. In fact, the living room was cleaner than it normally was. Night arrived, and I heard the usual orchestra of scratching and creaking amidst the concentrated scent of urine before I could fully drift off. I lowered myself to the floor feet first this time so I couldn't hurt my head, and, to my worst fears, I saw two red eyes staring back at me. I know that dogs can't smile or laugh or anything, but I could have sworn that this monster had been. Then again, I also know that dogs can't talk, yet he started anyways. Hello, Edward, he said cheerfully. Please don't fade again. I promise I don't enjoy biting. Talking dogs. <laughs> Forget that. 
I thought as my vision started to fade for a third time. He ran behind me and caught my head like a pillow, causing me to jump up before I could fully escape reality. Why the freak are you living under my bed? And what are you? I managed to stammer out after a stream of expletives. Well, he said, I'm a dog with goat hooves and horns. He gently lowered and shook his head. I have a name, but you wouldn't know it. It's not important. My job is to guide and protect travelers. So I assure you that I'm only here to help. Yeah, I can see that. But why are you under my bed? I had reached a point where everything around me seemed so surreal that I had begun to accept it as normal. I suppose it's a defense mechanism, maybe rationalization, but I felt entirely helpless anyway. Well, you've been plagued with nightmares recently. Most people define journeys as going from point A to point B. But are not dreams included in this definition? Your body may not travel, but your mind certainly does. And you are no less prone to harm while sleeping. He had lost me at the point where a dog started to talk, but I nodded along anyway. What do you have to do with my dreams? I inquired. You spent so much time running to that little tree that you never looked back to see why the black dog hadn't caught up. After all, the tree is a far distance away, and he certainly has the speed to make it before you. I began racking my mind for an answer, but the dream was too frightening to relive. Here, I'll help you out. Try to picture his tail when you were up in the tree. Suddenly, the dog's grotesque figure leaped into my mind, this time from a bird's eye view. It's all bloodied and cut up, I said, forcing my eyes open. Ding, ding, ding. That's usually what happens when one beast grabs another by his tail. I swear he smiled again. Does that mean? It does. I was there in the woods as well. You were technically a traveler, even if you were just wandering off from your picnic site. After all, there are many types of travels. A journey of even three feet can be made an adventure by the young, imaginative mind. If I'm remembering correctly, you were pretending to be a pirate, trying to rescue a maiden, when you suddenly stumbled upon my friend, Blackbeard, instead. Think of me like the English Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Sportswood. My job is to stop and kill Blackbeard, wherever he may try to wreak havoc. And I've gotten very good at it. Okay, well, good night, I said, slurring the words together. I know that in movies and stuff, we would have had this mind-opening conversation that leads to some big epiphany on my part. But these writers have never experienced what I faced. Not only is your entire mind overwhelmed, it fixates itself on a single aspect of what is happening to try and reduce its burden. I was fixated on the fact that a dog was talking, and everything else went over my head, or at least under my conscience. Our rational brain simply hasn't de developed to process impossibility. That's the job of imagination. And the amount of schemas that I needed to accommodate to rationalize this tangible beast would have driven me mad. I guess I could have dissociated, and I did for a bit, but the easiest thing to do was to sleep. Sleep and pretend like nothing out of the ordinary happened. That night, in my nightmare, the black dog was wearing a pirate's hat and an eye patch. I laughed, and when I woke up, I found a small, felted naval officer between my arm and body. It was the only comforting gesture capable of breaking my stubborn shell of logic and reason, if only for a moment. Since that night... I have left my monster more or less alone. I'm still afraid of dogs, but much less so than I once was. Now my fear is limited to large black dogs who have hooves and smell like piss. It's a fairly minute demographic. On holidays and my worst nights, he usually leaves a small present on my head. I suppose as a friendship gesture. 
I must say that his felting skills have improved tremendously, and he's even begun to pick up crochet. From time to time, however, I feel the black dog is still watching me on deserted roads when a yellowed darkness encroaches my every sense. I can see his red eyes stalking through deserted alleyways. When I'm alone in my apartment, longing for my family, I hear the rattling of his chain behind me, and I know that he is preparing to strike, sealing the kill once and for all. During these nights, no rational thought is able to pierce the screen of evil that engulfs me, blurring the lights of the world until only fetid darkness remains. Whenever I'm at my most vulnerable, and I know that the black dog has gained my scent once more, I spend a night talking to the monster under my bed. He always quells my fear, providing a friend in an abandoned world. For me, he's become an escape from reality, a paradoxical collision between two worlds of childish imagination and, and empirical logic. I've been living with him for a decade since we first interacted, and my life has generally improved. After a small discussion, my bedroom, now an apartment, has even gone from smelling like burnt sulfur to smelling like urine with a hint of wet dog and heart infusion dog shampoo. Perhaps it would be beneficial if more people opened the floodgates to the world of impossibilities every now and then. After all, indulging the ghosts of our reality can only blind us to a more universal, if occulted, presence in life. Kindness. Thank you, my darlings. I certainly hope you enjoyed this little tale. And if you liked my video on otherworldly dogs, perhaps you can recognize the two that are in this story. I certainly enjoyed it and would like to thank Lord Blackland for allowing me to tell you this little tale. If you enjoyed it, Please like and subscribe, and I will see you next time, my darlings, under the trees. <laughs>